Uh, the title of this symposium is From Gene Editing to Gene Writing. We've heard a lot of gene editing, and some of you have probably been wondering, what's the gene writing part? Are, when are we going to get to the gene writing part? So I think now is the time. We can, do, we can debate what's the difference between editing and when does editing become writing. If you edit so much, you're actually writing maybe. But uh, this is um, the, the, the gene writing part and the synthetic biology part, and it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Patrick Tsai. Where he is the professor and chair of synthetic genomics at the University of Manchester. Um, um, he had received his bachelor's degree in computer science in China, a master's degree in bioinformatics at the University of Edinburgh, and a PhD in genetics and bioinformatics and computational biology at Virginia Tech. He did his postdoc under Jeff Booker. Booker. Yeah, I have, I've always called it Bokey. Booker. And some of you may know Jeff. He is a, one of the, the leaders of synthetic chromosomes, synthetic genomes, which I think we're going to hear a lot about in yeast. Um, he's also a senior scientific consultant to the BGI, Beijing Genomics Institute, and the first Autodesk Distinguished Scholar. So from 2013 to 2017, he had his own research group at University of Edinburgh with a Chancellor's Fellowship and his lab focuses on computer-assisted design, synthetic biology, neochromosome design, which I think you're going to hear a lot about today as well, in yeast, DNA assembly automation. And in the summer of 2017, he moved to the University of Manchester as the new chair professor in synthetic genomics. He co-founded the Edinburgh Genome Foundry and the International Center for Synthetic Genomics at BGI, and a member of the GP Write, so that's the genome project, but for writing rather than reading, which is sequencing, at the Chinese Academy of Sciences. Um, and I learned at dinner last night that he has a history with the iGEM organization, a synthetic biology organization for uh, getting students involved in synthetic biology. If you haven't looked it up, um, if you haven't heard of it, uh, Google it. And he's not only was a member of a team, when he was a student, but has supported it a lot through that. So I thought that was very interesting. With that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this invitation to speak in Bale. Um, I'm the off-target speaker of this symposium, so I'm not going to tell you anything about CRISPR. I'm going to tell you something about you know the work has been going on in my group about writing the genome. So what I call synthetic genomics is really I see it as a fusion between systems biology and synthetic biology. We try to engineer the cell from top down. So, you know, we just celebrated 20 years of the Human Genome Project. So this is the project we spent $3 billion and 15 years as an international effort to read out the DNA encoded in our genome. <clears throat> and it's not just a milestone in biotechnology and, and medicine, but it really established the concept, you know, um, um, genome is the operating system of the living organisms and really bridging the biological and digital worlds. So we now have technology. We can read almost every single species on this planet. Um, as Larry said, I, I grew up as a computer science, um, you know, um, student. So I, I'm very used to writing the apps to program new functions to computers. Very well, we quickly, I realized, what if we can start writing the code in DNA, right? So we should be able to assign new functions to living organisms. So I would like to ask this so provoking question, you know, what if we could write genomes at will? So this would lead to some tangible applications. So for instance, you know, um, new energy, right? So you can engineer bacteria to produce you know, biofilm, which is much needed. These days, um, you can you know, generate new chemicals um, <coughs> through biology and remediate the environment pollutions. But we just hear from Cassie this morning, you know, it can give you new food with you know, um, fortified nutrition, but also you know, um, efforts to reprogram the pig to become an organ donor. And that has you know, huge implication in human health. And we are in this pandemic, and we realize how important it to program biology to give us the vaccine and the hope to lead us out of all of this. So, you know, the, the technology which drives all of this is DNA sensors, right? So, so what I'm showing you here is, you know, a, a real PO, you know, from 1980s. And so George Church showed me this, you know, um, PO with me. So, so he sends us 10 base pairs 
okay, and that costs over $6,000 in the 1980s. And you can literally read a 10 base pair from the PO, right? But the technology moved on so quickly, you know, and this is what we call more slow for DNA census, right? So more slow for CPU and more slow for DNA census. That means the speed of DNA census is going to double every 18 months, and the price is getting cheaper and cheaper. And, and this really enables us to, you know, and release our imagination, you know, to rewrite the biology entities, right? So, um, so it all started in 1979, so we can write a small piece of DNA, and that's a sensitive tRNA, um, and that's a Nobel Prize um, achievement. But the competition goes up really quickly, right? So people start writing sensitive plasmids, gene clusters, and a few years ago, Craig Venter Institute demonstrated now you can basically resynthesize the bacterial genome. That's half a million base pair um, resynthesized. And then just a few years ago, um, my collaborator Jason Chen and LMB Cambridge, they resynthesized the E. coli genome, and that's four million base pair. And that's one of the largest you know, synthetic organisms being resynthesized today. And so what I'd like to focus today is tell you a bit about our effort in resynthesizing the first eukaryote genome, the yeast genome, right? So which is 12 million base pair. But it's not just a lot more base pair we want to make, but I would like to tell you we are doing a lot more design in this, <coughs> in this effort. So this is an international consortia I coordinate over the last 10 years. Um, so as you know, yeast has 16 chromosomes. And then, you know, um, we have universities, we have 10 universities from four continents and each of us take one chromosome or two to synthesize. My group contributes chromosome two, so this 770 KB, um, this has been published. We recently finished chromosome seven, that's a meaning based pair. Um, we also had an add-on chromosome called Nia chromosome, so this is a chromosome which has nothing else but all the 275 tRNA genes, um, and this is quite unique. Um, so as I told you, right, so we are doing this as a crowdsourcing effort, right? So Craig Venter demonstrate an institution can do it by its own, but what we'd really like to do is make it open source so everyone can, you know, participate, you know, contribute, and, but also we make all the material free of any MTA. So, you know, there's no IP entanglement. So what we would like to do is we would like to use software, you know, computer software to implement design principles into design realities. And then we can then transmit the design sequence to different sites. As I mentioned, there are about 10 partners across four continents. So if you see the genome as a pizza, right? So each of us is taking a slice of the pizza and we make it. And at the end of the day, we are now, you know, I'm happy to say we finished all, all the 16 chromosomes plus one, 17 chromosomes. We're in the process to merge them into um, a genome. So this is what we call distributed manufacture or fabrication. So I would like to take a step back and tell you my favorite organisms, um, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So what's in the name? Saccharomyces means sugar fungus, and cerevisiae means fungus beer. And that tells you, you know, the fantastic relationship we have this we have with these fantastic organisms. And actually, this is a picture about 2000 BC, and you can see. Uh, ancient Egyptian actually managed to use yeast to fermentate drinks. And, and, and this is, you know, um, a kilogram of yeast, and that's equivalent to a thousand eggs of the human population on this planet. And this is one of my favorite quotations, I think it's still in, you know, true today, by Benjamin Franklin. Beer is a living proof that God loves us and wants us to be happy. And I hope you will join me for a drink later at this afternoon. <coughs> So just a bit more about the yeast genetics, right? So yeast has 16 chromosomes, um, and it's, you know, human has 46. Uh, yeast only has 40 million base pair, and human has 6 billion base pair. And, and I, I, I know you probably asked, you told me you're going to sense has 12 million base pair. That's because we're going to start trimming down the yeast by about 2 million base pair, okay? Yeast has 6,000 genes, and human, you know, only have 20,000 genes consider the size of the genome. Yeast is a single cellular organism, and yeast can be haploid or diploid. And when it's haploid, it can either be made A or made alpha. <coughs> so as an engineer, 
before we start doing the design, we would like to lay out some ground rules. So, you know, we start thinking about what are the design principles which will override the design. So the first one is do not harm, even to the east. We don't want to compromise the fitness to the east, we want to maintain really high fitness just like wild type. Um, so people can use it for downstream applications in industries. Um, but, and also of the same, you know, um, objective, we want to maintain genome stability, we want to make the genome super stable. But on the other hand, this costs about $20 million to make one genome. We don't want to just make one design. We want to make billions of design as well. So in a way, we would like to increase the genetic flexibility. So it sounds like a competing agenda here, but I'm, I'm going to tell you how we achieve both of them. So once we decide our design principles, we start you know, digging in and, and try to re refine what we want to do with intensive design. So we do a lot of deletions. So we remove a lot of repeated elements, for instance, you know, September Merrick repeats. We remove all the transposons. So these are, you know, um, racial transposons. We don't think they're essential. So we take them all out. We remove all the introns in the beginning of our design because there's a group in Canada, they have a cell paper a few years ago said, you know, intron is not important for cell viability in yeast. We take them all out. Three years into the project, the same group published another cell paper. So, wait a minute. Ribosome and protein intron is pretty important for fitness. <laughs> so, so we go back and then we put all the ribosome and protein introns back. But this is just, <laughs> this is just a way to, to show you, you know, our design can co-evolve with our knowledge, right? So if there's a new evidence that comes out, we can always go back and revise our design, okay? And then we relocate all the TRN genes, and because TRN genes is the genome damage hotspot, they are the insertion hotspot for TY transposon being transcribed really heavily. So in my group, we create a new chromosome. We relocate all these 275 TRN genes on a near chromosome. We call it party chromosome, so they can do whatever they want on that chromosome. And, and the aim is really try to understand the essentiality of these elements, but also to stabilize the genome. Right? And then we modify the genome to some extent, right? So we embed over 4,000 PCR tag. So these are silent mutations we introduce into the coding region. So they encode the same amino acid, but they're at least 33% different in terms of DNA. So you can quickly figure out a piece of DNA sensitive wild type. Now we also inspired by George Church and Jason Chung's group, we take out the, the most rare stock codon. We take out the TAG stock codon and change it to TAA. Um, so the implication is, at the end of the day, we have a TIG-free organism. You can reprogram the TRNA synthetase to, to bring in the 21st amino acid. Um, and finally, I think most exciting um, is we add the lost P sites, right? So we did not delete any gene. We keep all the genes intact throughout the entire genome. But we put a lost P site downstream to every 3 prime UTI in the genome. So at the end of that, we have about 4,000 lost piece size across the entire genome. And this is a, a project we call Scramble. This would allow us to stochastically rearrange the genome on demand and give us an opportunity to start seeing the genotype to phenotype relationship. I'm gonna tell you a little bit more. Um, so I tell you, you know, we remove a lot of you know, genetic elements, try to be a slick designer genome. Um, and we also put in those pieces. These are add-on SNPs to the DNA sequence, which will allow us to rearrange the genome. Um, just a bit more on, <coughs> on the you know, recoding. So I told you, you know, um, TAG has been swapped with TAA, and this allows us to bring the 21st amino acid, but this also gives us additional safety control over the organisms, because then, you know, this species is going to be a totally different vocabulary than the wild type yeast. And then, um, you know, we remove a lot of elements like transposons and repeat regions and relocate all the TRN genes, try to stabilize the genome. Well, I told you about the loss P site. <laughs> they are not the traditional loss P site you use. They are symmetric loss P site, meaning there are 34 base pair involved repeats. They are perfect panadromic, right? So the implication of this is if you flank a piece of DNA, in this case, it's a green arrow, but a pair of lost P same side. If you turn on Cree induction, 
you got 50% of the chance the two lost P sites are going to pair like, like, like this and loop out the DN in the middle, so you got deletion. And 50% of the chance you got you know, um, pairing like this, you got inversion of the sequence, right? And the combination also give you duplication and transfer location. Um, and this is really a way we can you know, stochastically generate lots and lots of variants. And this is the system I, I, I refer as a scramble, right? So synthetic chromosome rearrangement and modification by loss p mediate evolution. So it's quite a mouthful name, but it tells you what we'd like to do with the genome, right? So again, if you see the genome as a deck of car, and every gene being a car in the deck, you've got 6,000 um, cars in your hand. The, log, um, the, the scramble system allows you to reshuffle the deck of car. You can change the order of the genes, you can invert some genes, you can duplicate some genes, you can even throw away some of the genes from your genome, right? So the idea is, you know, when we finish the sensitive yeast genome, it's a homogeneous population. We give it a smooth induction of create recombinants, and then we can select for different phenotype. So just to elaborate what I said, right? So we are going to put this, you know, sensitive yeast into you know, either kinomore start or you can do it with a batch transfer. So this is quite easy to do in your lab if you don't have a chemo start. So you can, you know, turn on scramble. So all of a sudden you got these, you know, billions and billions of combination of genotype in that in that chemo start under different stress conditions or whatever you're selecting for. And this is what I call a cage fight for the East, right? So only the guys can survive in that condition with dominate the population, and then every 10 days we do single colony purification. And then we fish out the winners, and we can put them back so they can repeat the cycle as many times as, you, as they want. But we typically do five cycles, so you know, about just about a month and a half cycle. And then we, we fish out to the winners, and then we do NGS and transcriptome, and also chromatin structure, try to figure out what makes a winner, okay? <clears throat> So I told you the design principles, and I tell you, you know, the designs we want to do. But that represents over a thousand edits per chromosome, and that's probably why we cannot do CRISPR in the first place. You know, because we're talking about thousands of edits per chromosome. <clears throat> but that's a lot of design to be done by hand by human experts. So we, you know, design software called you know BioStudio. So basically what we have done is taking the genome browser, so you probably use genome browser to look at you know, gene contents in the genome. But genome browser is equivalent to a Google map. You use Google map to look for landscape you know, in the city. You don't use that for design. So we essentially hijack the Google map for the genome and you know, turn that into a design software. So what I'm going to show you is a video, right? So what you, we are looking at here is you know, half a million base pair chromosome five, you know, so, you know, um, 576,000 base pair. And what you're looking at here is, you know, each of these arrows is a gene um, in that chromosome, right? And, and I, I'll show you some of these design features as we play the video. Um, so you're seeing the design happening in real time, right? So what you're seeing here is some green bars has been embedded in the gene. So these are PCR tag being embedded at the right location. And then you see a lot of green diamonds being embedded in the right location as well. So these are loss P stem sites. Um, you see some closes. So these are elements that get, you know, TR transpose on TR and gene being taken out. So you could see deletion. And then if you have eagle eye, you can see some genes now finish with a purple dot. So these are genes finished with TAG. The software turned that into TAA. Okay. So now let's, the design finished. So, um, so you can see the chromosome gets much, much shorter because we start taking out some of these elements I mentioned. But this is just you know, um, a few seconds we were talking about. So we can now really streamline the design you know, from you know, hours of human design to seconds of computer edit design. And, and I can tell you, we have now implemented this software and that has been scaled up to all the synthetic chromosomes and we rarely got any problems, right? So whenever we got a problem, it's normally not the computer problem. It's because of biology we, we don't understand, okay? But I hope, you know, with this you know, particular side, I convince you, we have technology, we can take design principles, turn that into design realities, okay? Um, but it's described in this particular paper I listed here. 
Now the next you know, step is, you know, you design the DNA sequence. But if you don't have technology to make it, it would not do you much good, right? So I hope I also convince you we have technology now to synthesize chromosome size DNA, right? So, you know, in our very first synthetic chromosome paper, we did the same approach as Craig Venter, right? So we synthesized 90,000 base pairs synthetic DNA. That's the right arm of chromosome 9R. And then we then transform into the yeast and truncate the wild type chromosome. And it worked. And it's all great. But it's kind of crazy thinking about it from an engineering perspective. You try to take the operating system from your computer and you do all kinds of thousands of edits to, the, to your computer system and then hope you can reboot the computer. If it, it, it does not reboot, then you have a problem. right? So we said, OK, we want to engineer something which is more engineerable. right? So we come up with this strategy called SWAT-IN. So what you're looking at here is we take the wild type chromosome. So this wild type chromosome on top is a scaffold, right? So you can take the wild type chromosome, and then you synthesize 30,000 base pair to 50,000 base pair, what we call chunk, and then you tuck it with a marker, Euro3 in this, in this case. So with a, a bit of homologous, you can recombine in. You can swap out the wild type DNA and swap in the synthetic DNA, and the next step, you can go in with the next 30 to 50,000 base pair synthetic DNA, Tuck it with the second marker, U2, and then you, you can take out the first marker, put in the second marker. Just recycling two markers, you can systematically wipe out the entire wild type chromosome with sensitive DNA. So this is you know, really working well for us for a few reasons, because it is equivalent to you have a book, and you're replacing one paragraph by one paragraph. If at some point the cell becomes really sick or even the cell die, you can go back and dissect the last you know, um, you know 30,000 base pair you put in. And then, but also we can parallelize these because you can imagine a team going from left and the other one goes from right, and then we do a mating in, in the middle. So this really speed up our process. And I'm going to show you how we use this technology to debug some of the synthetic chromosome work we do. So um, hopefully this slide will convince you we don't just have the design software, we also have the technology to make synthetic chromosome up to a few million base pair. So, you know, leveraged by the technology, you know, of design and synthesis, my PhD student, Chantal, she synthesized two chromosomes during her three years PhD with me. So I'm going to show you one of the synthetic chromosomes she makes. So this is chromosome two. So this is 770,000 base pair functional in vivo. And this was one of the um, largest synthetic chromosomes in the world. So she make it, and she, you know, um, came to my office and said, you know, we finished the synthetic chromosome, now what? And I said, we need to look at, you know, the phenotype, right? So we systematically benchmark our SYN2, so this synthetic chromosome 2, uh, you know, with its two parents, and then across different conditions. I only show you a few, but we systematically benchmark the um, the, the fitness across about 40 different conditions, different temperature, different chemicals, different sugar base, we don't see much difference, okay? It's it, indistinguishable. And that's quite encouraging because after thousands of ages to that chromosome, we still remain really high fitness. Then you look at set, you know, chromosome segregation, it segregates just like wild type. And actually it segregates slightly better than the wild type because presumably because we take some of the repeats. And then you look at chromosome replication, it replicates just like wild type. Okay? So we're really encouraged. And then we took a step further, right? So I, I, in, in the beginning of my talk, I said we're taking a substance biology approach to design the chromosome and synthesize the chromosomes. So we use omics. So we do transomics. We look at DNA, RNA, protein, metabolite across the entire genome, right? Of thousands and thousands of features we, we profile, we only got a few up regulation and down regulation. And so again, that really, really pleasing us because you know that means all, after thousands of ages, you know, we did not disturb the cell much. But I would not be honest if I don't tell you we do have a problem. Right? So under very special condition in YPG 37 degree, our cell becomes smaller. So again, so yeast 
likes glucose. It does not normally survive on glycerol. And it doesn't like 37 degree, it grows at 30 degree. So of all these 40 conditions, we see a small phenotype. The cell becomes smaller in YPG, 37 degree. You know, we may get away with the review in, in science, say, oh, of all these conditions, we do have a small problem in a very unusual condition. But inside, we are engineered, we got super excited, right? We now have a problem, we can try to debug so we come up with two strategies, right? So the first strategy is, can we do classic mapping? Because I told you we swap in 30,000 base pair by 30,000 base pair, and every state we save the in intermediate strain, right? So we can pull them out and see at what stage the, muta the, the mutation was introduced. And the second strategy is, you know, forget about all of these. Let's just scramble the cell, and let the cell lead us to the crew, right? So the first strategy is quite simple, right? So, you know, I told you we save the intermediate, and then when we save it, we name them from A to Z. So you can see after the chunk W, the cell is really happy at YPG 37 degree. But as soon as you put in the next chunk, chunk X, you can see there's a phenotype, and the phenotype carries on, okay? So we hypothesize there must be something to do with this 30,000 base pair we put in. And then we drew in to see what we have done to that 30,000 base pair. We found one gene, which has something to do with glycerol response pathway. OK, that's a pretty good target. And then we drew in and said, OK, what have we done to that? The only thing we have done to that gene is we embed a PCR tag. So these are 25 base pair DNA sequence, which encode the same amino acid. So as soon as you revert the 25 base pair, you rescue the cell, right? And the second approach was done by my postdoc and Derek. <clears throat> so I convinced him, said, look, just take the sensitive yeast chromosome 2, give it a shot of Cree, and play the entire population on YPG 37 degree. And he did that. So what you're looking at here is a po population. You can see it's a mixture of small colonies and big colonies. So some colonies managed to revert the phenotype, right? So we went back and then purified these big colonies. We sequence them. We only see a few mutations, but surprisingly or not surprisingly, all these mutations, they have either physical or genetic interactions with the gene I just showed you using the first method. So we are quite encouraged because that means we're not just able to synthesize chromosomes, we also have a way to debug should there be problems. Okay, so we managed to debug a 25 base pair um, design problem in a near a minimum base pair chromosome. I hope, you know, like convince you, we can make synthetic chromosome now. So now we would like to scramble it, right? So, um, so this is the first proof scramble can work. So Chantal took the first synthetic chromosome arm. So this is um, near 100,000 base pair. So this is the right arm chromosome, um, chromosome nine. Um, and then she turned on scramble and she picked about 100 independent colonies after scramble, and, what you're, and then she sequenced them on using NGS. What you're looking at here is, on top this is the unscrambled parental, so that's 100 KB. And then, and down here is independent colony we sequenced. So the first thing you will see is, this is a beautiful distribution of lenses, right? So some chromosomes get shorter because they start losing non-essential elements. But some of them getting bigger, and the biggest one is quadruple the original size, so that's 400 KB. And that's quite encouraging, because you're also potentially getting gain-of-function mutations. Um, what you don't see here is none of these two, um, there, there are no two colonies we pick off the same genotype. And statistically, they should not be, right? Because pairwise interaction of 43 loss P size. And then the other thing you don't see here is we don't see any off-target recombination. Whenever there's a rearrangement, it only happens between loss P side, meaning they are precisely engineered in. Okay, so this is a proof we can turn on scramble and generate a really diverse phenotype, a uh, genotype. And I just going to show you some of the applications. So one of the applications is we would like to use these to evolve strains which can tolerate stress. Okay, so 
you know, what I'm showing you here is a particular stress which is ethanol. So yeast fermentate and produce ethanol. But yeast is not particularly good at tolerating high percentage of ethanol. That's why your, your wine stops at a certain percentage, right? So what we have done is we turn on scramble, and then you collect the entire population on non-ethanol containing media, and then you got big colonies, small colonies. But you put them on 8% ethanol containing media, you only got a few colonies. But these are the guys which are really interesting. So we purify these guys, make sure they're truly resistant to ethanol um, strikes. And then we demonstrate, you know, um, you know, some of these actually become really good at tolerating high percentage ethanol. Some of them can tolerate up to 25% um, ethanol. And these guys not just, you know, better at tolerating ethanol. They're better at producing ethanol now, right? Because, you know, if you cannot tolerate what you produce, of course, you're not going to survive. Um, so this is very encouraging because it's a very universal approach to allow you to turn on scramble and look for, you know, resistant um, phenotype. And then we take a step further, right? So we can now depool the, the whole population into two pools, resistant pool, recessive pool, right? And then we can use, quickly use PCR to attack, to identify regions which are common to the re resistance strain, right? So in this particular case, we identify as a loss of the three-point UTR or ACE2, which leads to the resistant phenotype and which has never been reported in literature. And the implication of that is you can use synthetic yeast as a prototype chassis to identify novel mutations which can lead to phenotype. And then you can now go back to industrial strain and make the mutation and have a resistance strain, right? Again, this is one universal approach. You can apply to high temperature, high pH, different compound concentration. And I hope I convince you we have a technology now to scramble for stress torrent. Um, phenotype, and, and this is the other application so done by my P, uh, PhD student, V. So what she has done is she looked into natural product space, right? So, you know, um, I'm not going to tell you too much about what she has done, but basically she can synthesize gene clusters on a linear piece of DNA, tuck it with a pair of lost pieces inside, and then she transferred the linear piece of DNA which encode the gene cluster into the sensitive yeast background, turn on scramble, so what it does is it randomly inserts a gene cast to different lox p stem site in the genome. But at the same time, it arranges the genome. So it called evolve the background to cope with the natural product pathways. So what she demonstrates is, you know, she can take a pathway which encodes violation. So this is an anti-cancer drug. She can evolve the strain which become overproducers of that particular compound. And she also demonstrated it's quite a universal approach. You know, she can also, you know, scramble for beta, beta carotene, which is precursor of vitamin A. So again, this is very really universal approach, which can be applied to many different gene clusters. So, you know, I'm a firm believer, when you build a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So we are looking for applications, and that was, that's why I'm very keen to come to Bell Foundation and looking for people who may use our technology. Um, so we recently just um, done a Bill Gates Foundation grant so for anti-TB drugs, so we are taking gene clusters um, through genome mining in column in our synthetic yeast near chromosome. I'm hope, hoping we'll get some new compounds. Um, but I also want to finish by telling a little bit about you know, my thinking of this, you know, synthetic genomics field and where it's going, right? So when I come to Edinburgh in 2013, you know, um, at the time, the synthetic chromosome work was done by undergraduate students in Johns Hopkins. And there are hundreds of students literally pipetting day and night trying to make synthetic DNA. And, and when I come to Scotland, I realized actually I cannot do that in Scotland because you know we don't have that, that much population. Um, so I start looking into industries, right? So I think, okay, maybe we can automate the DNA synthesis and the somebody process. And the turning point is really coming from my engineering background. We don't see DNA synthesis and the somebody as a biological problem. We see it as a manufacturing problem. It should not be different from making your clothes, making your cars. It's a multi-step process. And every step you have QC, and, and every step you can re 
re reschedule the failures. And then and I would like to finish by telling you some of the technology we invented. So when you think about automation, you think about these gigantic leaf handlers, which are very expensive, but also they rely on tips, um, meaning they can only do microliter dispensing. They're just as good as your hands, right? So when I come to Edinburgh, I discover actually we can do something different. So we basically look at this acoustic dispenser. Um, you know, as you know, sound can move liquid. That's why when you go to a party, if the music is really loud, you can feel the liquid in your cup is shaking, and that's acoustic energy trying to move the liquid in your cup, right? So we, we look at one of these technology. I'm going to show you the video again, right? So this is a printer size of, you know, um, dispenser. It has only one moving part, which is the transducer. So this transducer sends a sound energy, sends a sound wave, right? Um, it sits in the bottom of your source plate, but the destination plate is upside down. So they're facing each other, and this is important. So <clears throat> to start, the transducer sends a sound wave and get a refraction pattern. And based on refraction pattern, it's smart enough to figure out what kind of liquid is there, how much liquid is there, and more importantly, how much energy do I need to shoot off 2.5 nanoliter droplets? <clears throat> and the implication is you don't need to have the same amount of liquid in your plate. You don't even need to have the same type of liquid in your plate. So the transducer goes around and do the initial survey to understand what's in your plate, right? <clears throat> So when I finish, it goes back to the first well, okay? And then it sends just enough energy to shoot off 2.5 nanoliter droplets, and, and it flies through, and because the destination plate is upside down, so it just go to the bottom of the destination well, and because surface tension is stay there, okay? So we look at this technology, say, fantastic, because A, it can do now little droplets. It can reduce the assembly volume by a thousand fold. But also, there's no tips. You know, there's no contamination. And actually, we realized in COVID, not relying on tips is so important for us. Um, and and we demonstrate now we can really you know downscale the DNA assembly from microliter to now little droplets, and then the efficiency actually better than do it by hand. Okay, and what you're seeing is a close-up of 2.5 nanoliter droplet being shot off from the surface. Okay, with that, I would like to you know tell you now we start industrialize some of this you know chromosome work in Edinburgh and, and now in Manchester. We build this gigantic foundry. Nothing compared with your operation here, but you know we try to you know automate some of the steps. And then you know this is the economics. Um, you know talking about our work in DIY chromosome, but in the same um, you know, a cover assist to the rise of robots. I think in their imagination, we just a bunch of uh, nuts and sitting there with a uh, you know joystick and try to control a robot to make chromosome. But maybe that's the future. Thank you. <laughs>